Morning. 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 Good to be together on this, the Lord's Day. Another day to begin the week, to gather in this place, in our Lord's presence as he's called us here to worship him. And we're beginning a new series this morning, so I wanted to begin with these words. Uh, those of you who know me, um, especially when Daniel was here, I used to keep him going a little bit because he was a lover of John's gospel, but I tried to convert him because obviously the best gospel is Matthew, of course, um, because I love how Matthew begins. I love how Matthew structured the entire book with all of the five teaching blocks, but of course, I love particularly how it ends. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. And when I read what Matthew has put in at the end of his gospel, I see the church. I see the church doing exactly what we might expect the church to be doing, gathered in worship of Jesus. But Matthew doesn't leave it there. Then he says this, Jesus then came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. They're gathered to worship. Jesus shows up and sends them. Go. Go to all nations, go to every place, all people. Go and teach them, go and share what you now know. Go and share what you've experienced. Go and share your story. What might that look like for each and every one of us to do just that? Well, today we are embarking on an eight-week series, an eight-week training course to become contagious Christians. So let's begin. Let's stand and begin as we give thanks to our Lord. Let's sing together.
God is with us. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the privilege that you have granted to each and every one of us, your people, to come before you at the beginning of another week, the beginning of another awesome day, to just lift our voices in worship and adoration of you, to focus our minds, our hearts, our souls on you. King David wrote the most beloved psalm, and in it he reminds us exactly of what we see so many times in Scripture, your promise to be with us. Wherever we go and whatever we're doing, you are always with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Lord Jesus, you promised that you would go with your disciples wherever they go. May we claim that promise today, not just in our heads, but in our lives. May we know that wherever we go, you are with us. The living God is with us, beside us, supporting us, cheering us on as we go to live our lives and seek to be faithful to you. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray into our midst today at the beginning of this series. We commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves individually and collectively as a body, as a church family. Help us, guide us, to be as contagious as we possibly can be for your glory's sake. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's love is too great for us to understand. It is wider than the ocean, deeper than the deepest sea. We cannot write about it or express it in words, and yet it is ours, though undeserving we are. Let's stand and sing the love of God.
song is going to be an exciting round but we're going to give you an opportunity to learn it first so we're going to do it all together once and then we will pause and then you'll get instructions but another song that describes God's amazing love for us Wonderful. Okay, so this side, following me, and we are going first. So we're going to sing it two and a half times through. Okay, this side, following Shani, you're going to come in with Behold when the other side are singing that. You got it? <laughs> the first time. <laughs> the first Behold. Just make it up as you go along, David. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to sing twice through and this side are going to end up singing your chorus all together totally clear as mud okay <laughs> just sing enjoy um it's all about god's love I know it's not a competition, but we won. Uh, <laughs> well, let me, a couple of quick announcements uh, this morning, uh, if I can find my sheet. Um, so, yes, we are starting uh, this series today. Um, it is, uh, there's a, the series has been produced by Bill Hybels, Lee Strobel, Mark Middleberg, and so the video sessions and the uh, participant guides are on the Google Drive. Uh, only for the first two sessions are the uh, participant guides done. So if you are part of a small group, uh, you are welcome to go on to the Google Drive. The link is on the newsletter. If you're struggling to get access, drop me an email and I will help you um, to watch the videos and fill out the questionnaire. If you want a paper copy of session one of the guide that we've kind of put together, it's at the door so you can grab that on your way out. If you're not part of a small group, you don't want to do it on your own, then you've got an opportunity to gather with some folks. Krishna is going to be actually running the series, the videos and the guide on Friday nights via Zoom, uh, 7 o'clock to 8.30. Please email him uh, because we're trying to work out just exactly how many people are going to join that. That's next Friday night. It's the first one of those sessions, 7 o'clock to 8.30. The hope is 
that everybody will obviously be going through the eight weeks that we're doing on a Sunday morning. I'm hoping that what I do in terms of sermons will supplement what's in the material and that over these eight weeks, we will learn and develop a little bit about becoming more contagious Christians. Uh, this week, we got a finalization that uh, we are going to be co-hosting a conference in November. Uh, one of the uh, topics that's a huge discussion point at the minute in a lot of countries, um, or sales being one of them, Britain, uh, it's a very hot topic at the minute, is medical assistance in dying. And so um, I've teamed up with Todd Weeb and with Sam Gutterberg, who's actually the new minister up at North Lonsdale United Church. And between the two of us, Sam and myself, we're actually going to be co-hosting a conference Friday night, the 15th of November, Saturday, the 16th of November. I know it's early notice, but just to kind of get it into your heads, because there's probably neighbors, friends you have, and this is a topic that people are talking about like the numbers are staggering of the number of people that are going for made at the minute and we're just wanting to have a conversation uh professor jason biasi is coming in uh from toronto to actually lead it we've got a number of people on a kind of discussion panel going to have some breakout groups question and answer times more details will come more advertising will come but just get it uh in your minds that we are planning to do that and i would encourage you to start praying over it um, because we want sam todd and myself our goal is trying not to sound as if we want to tell the community what the church thinks about made that's not the goal the goal is to actually offer some tools to the community to discuss and think about made dying uh, better um, so that's kind of the, the, um, the goal of that. So I'd encourage you to be thinking and praying about that. Our Christmas market is coming up this year. Uh, we are actually slightly different. We're actually hosting a Christmas market. You think, well, what does that mean? Uh, Del, uh, Delbrook Community Center uh, is not there anymore. And that's usually where there was a big Christmas market. And so we're actually going to host one here. So we've opened it up to vendors to actually come and uh, have a table, rent a table here, and provide a service to the community. So again, if you know people in your communities, friends, neighbors, who like these kind of farmers market kind of things, and they, you know some vendors that would like, please get them in touch with us. Uh, we have a Google form. I'm not totally certain, Alana, how it's advertised, how they access that. It's, it's just, where is it? Is it just on our Facebook page or? Yeah, so, it, and the, the um, like marketplace and stuff is where they would, most of the vendors would tend to go to find out where these markets are, but um, it would encourage just to get the word out, and we're trying to put it together to have the, the, the building full of vendors and provide a service to the community. Again, you think about our November conference and our Christmas market in December, it's just an opportunity for us to have the community come in, for us to get to know the community, and for them to get to know us. Uh, the Canadian Blood Services are starting to come back. That's not going to be this week, but the first Wednesday in October. And they'll be here every other week as well. And so we're hoping, uh, again, just through some advertising, we've updated the front entrance, that people will get to know us a little bit better. So I'm excited by this series. And one of the ideas that I had all along when I was thinking about this series um, is that the goal is for us to become a little bit more comfortable in sharing our stories, learning how to kind of talk about our faith and things like that. So actually, um, I contacted some uh, willing volunteers uh, in the church family, and they're going to help us. Over these next eight weeks, we're going to hear from a different person every week, and they're going to share a little bit about uh, their story so we can all develop um, how can we do this better. So this morning, I'm going to invite Sandy to come up and join me. Hello, that is on. Morning. Good morning. Have a seat. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make you comfortable. That's good. Because just in case you're here, like, and you're going to be preaching for 20 minutes. No. <laughs> so, so, Sandy, great to actually see you uh, uh, up front. Usually you're up 
taking minutes at meetings and you're doing uh, the bookkeeping and on envelope secretary and things like that. So it's, this is an opportunity for us to get to know uh, a little bit more about you. Ev is obviously um, your worst half um, as an elder in our church. Alan is your daughter. We're not going to say anything more about that. Uh, but about you. So we want to actually hear a little bit from you. So how did you become a Christian? Tell us a little bit about your story. Do you want the Coles and Order version? Whatever. <laughs> I asked you how long this was going to be, and you said you had no idea, so let's see. Okay. Keep the microphone nice and close, sorry, so that everybody can hear you, especially those at home as well. Okay, so I was born into not a Christian family, but a not, not a non-Christian family. So in other words, they weren't anti. My grandmother was Catholic, had lots of persecution on the island she was because she was the only Catholic and amongst a bunch of Protestants. So that's what my dad saw. So he didn't like religion. But they wanted us to have some training. So they did send us, there was a uh, Pentecostal bus that came around where we lived, took us to New Westminster. So we went there for probably a year or so. Um, so there was, so I had under, I heard the stories. Can't say I understood. Uh, heard. And then um, I got this job in a company and uh, one, it was a small company, uh, but our controller was Jewish. And then there was a uh, Christian girl that her and I did the same job. And so they would have conversations all the time. So, and I probably should add, this was a young company. Everybody was under 30. So it was, um, it, people were free to express opinions. Well, we, there was five of us broke away from the major company and, and went to start, the, the guys started off on their own. And so then that girl left, the first girl left, then we had a second one, she was Christian. And then we hired another salesman and he was Christian. And so there was always the conversation in the company. So um, I, the, Patty was always uh, trying to get me to go to church with her. So the poor girl did get me to go one night. <laughs> and I said to her, I don't care what they do, what your minister says. I just don't want to hear about the devil. So his last words were, <laughs> as soon as you walk out that door tonight, the devil is going to be after you. So you have, to, you have to rely on God to protect you. But anyways, so I didn't go back to her church. Again. <laughs> uh, well, then I, then I had, then there was the year. Uh, oh, sorry, I should add, during all that, I would listen to Billy Graham. Mm. And there was another fellow in Vancouver. I don't know, some people might know him. His name was Terry Winter. And he was a lovely, gentle Christian. In um, Billy Graham type, very soft, where it uh, didn't matter what you had done, Jesus could forgive you. And that was the big thing, because we all feel guilty for something. I felt guilty because I'd been very mean to uh, a girl I went to school with who was Christian. Then they moved away, and I had to write, I was sitting there on the floor in tears because I'd been so mean to her, so I wrote her a letter. Anyway. <laughs> So I think God was working on me for many years. Mm. And then there was the year. I took a photography class and there was a young lady I was partnered with. She was a Christian. I went to see my friend in New Brunswick and uh, I had a long stopover in Montreal. And there was this beautiful young girl who came and sat beside me. And this girl was an on fire Christian. And it was yuck, 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 yuck. so I was so two hours we were there so then I was really happy I got in the plane and I go Phew. the flight attendant came along and said is anybody sitting in the seat and I went no she says well there's a really rowdy group up the front and somebody would like to move back would that be okay sure it was that girl <laughs> so, so I from Montreal to Vancouver her and she was just she was really lovely she was coming to get married so anyways and my uncle came that year and we were driving down Willingdon because him and dad and I were going to Horseshoe Bay and he was talking about why he knew Jesus who was 
who he was. And that was because of the reaction of the disciples. Now, we've probably heard that loads of times, but that time it took effect. So then I went to, um, I went back into work and I said to Patty, you know, Patty, I think God's trying to tell me something. <laughs> she was so happy, so happy. Anyway, uh, I started going to a church on and off in Coquitlam and uh, it was good. I still wasn't committed, but then um, one night I uh, went to the pub where I used with people I used to work with and I'd heard about Ev that he was oh we've all heard about him yes yeah so this poor fellow he says I gave him the Spanish Inquisition because I was going to line <laughs> I was going to line him up with Patty because she was <laughs> we're looking for a nice Christian fellow to marry because she said that's it I'm not going to date any more non-Christians so I was going to line them up so that was the deal so anyway I did give him the Inquisition for her because it was safe <laughs> so i wanted to know if he would date a non-christian would he marry a non-christian and there was must have been loads of other questions in there anyway so he eventually phoned me the next week and we did go for coffee so and then i started coming to this church then uh, uh, i got to meet henry and leola and things changed like um, Patty was still there in my life, encouraging me. Dave, the other fellow from, he was encouraging me. They were so excited when they thought that I was gonna go to church. And I just felt like that year, God was roping me in, making sure I, he, had, he put everything there for me. That you can't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna turn your back on me this time. Yeah, so, I, so I'm, I'm intrigued, I, I, listening to your story. Two, two things jump out at me. The number of people that have been involved in it, that have been sharing and kind of talking to you about um, Jesus. I think for some folks, it just feels like those conversations never happen anymore. We don't actually talk about Jesus and kind of open to have it in your workplace. Um, but you've had loads of, um, loads of conversations with, with other people and people involved uh, in your life kind of uh, prompting you to kind of think more about faith and stuff so it, when you when you think about what it means to become a christian and stuff this idea of becoming a contagious christian what does that actually mean to you like have you seen that in your life what what when you hear this free as contagious christian what do you think about see i would put patty and dave in that category because they were living their faith and they weren't trying to browbeat or anything. It was just gentle. They just wanted more for me. And so I think to be contagious, you have to be really sincere and people have to trust you. Yeah. Yeah. So if, let me ask you then, um, if for you particularly, is there one thing that you could share with us if you thought, I'd like to become more contagious. What do you think that would mean for you? Probably stepping out a bit more. Tell us a little bit more. Well, I mean, I, I'm in a, in a, you guys all know I go to fitness classes. So there's a whole group of us. And they all know that I go to church. But do I take that one step further? No, I'm not. So that's what I would need to do is to explain further why I go. Like they know I go, they know that you come to our place and you and the girls. And so they know that there's re a relationship thing. And I, oh, that's the other thing I didn't put in. What those, what Patty and Dave did, it was a relationship they had with Jesus. Whereas before I wasn't seeing the relationship. So I have to show to the people that I'm around that it's a relationship I have and that they can have it too. So instead of just knowledge about Jesus, yes. that kind yep. of thing, like it's not just about doctrines that you know, and I go to church and I learn these things about Jesus, but Correct. it's actually having a personal relationship. How, how do you think we could all go deeper in our relationship with Jesus? That's tough. Obviously with prayer and study. Study just because... Uh, we learn from other people more, more how to behave, I believe. 
yeah. or how to interact. Yeah. So again, it's the togetherness part. Correct. It's not going it alone. It's actually, it's, it's interesting when you reflect back on your um, I, wrong term, but like pre-Christian life, yeah. right? Before yeah. people were involved in it, encouraging you, talking to you, but actually in your, once you become a Christian, there's still people involved. You need people in order to grow and go deeper mm -hmm. and things. It's always about relationships, not only with Jesus, but each other. We have to help each other to do this. Well, one of my favorite other. parts about being a member of a church is the community you know because it's it's we're like-minded so if i want to go to talk to anybody here about jesus i don't have to worry about what are they thinking yeah, yeah. so very nice didn't she do well for the first up <laughs> thanks sandy for actually sharing with us uh today and uh i think that i think now i'm going to release uh sophia uh with the sunday school kids uh, and we are going to, is it collect the morning offering? And then we'll sing. So can I invite the ushers to come forward? So Sophia's taking the uh, kids out for Sunday school. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for the blessings this morning. We thank you for the people that have been involved in Sandy's life over the years and uh, just for the way that they've nurtured her faith. And Lord, help us to think back over the blessings that you give us in our lives and the people that were involved in sharing their faith, their stories, uh, your love with us. Lord, we are, we are a blessed people for so many reasons. And we take that for granted, but help us now to, uh, through these offerings, this act of worship, of giving um, to you, to your church, to your mission, uh, may this help us to give everything um, uh, to glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. As the offering's being collected, let's start to quietly sing how deep the Father's love for us, a song almost of confession that it was our sins and our mocking voices that kept Jesus on that cross, and yet his love for us still forgives and redeems. So as the offering is collected, please feel free to stand.
Amen. Please be seated. Ev, would you come and lead us in prayer this morning? A tough act to follow. <laughs> yes, this is the time of the service for prayers of the people, and I'd like to uh, open with a uh, scripture, Nehemiah 9, verses 5 and 6. Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may be it exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Let us now offer prayer of thanksgiving and supplication to our God. Father God, Savior, Sustainer, we bring wholeness, who brings wholeness and value to human life. Glorious Father, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no God like you in all the heaven above or in the earth below. You know, we know that you keep your covenant showing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. Oh, how great are your riches in wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for you, for us to understand your ways. Your goodness to us as a church family has far exceeded anything we could have ever imagined. You are the God of compassion and mercy. You are slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. We come before you acknowledging that you are God. There's no power greater than the universe and you, we have the privilege of growing in eternal relationship with you. It is with you we are made and we are yours. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We enter your gates with praise and we enter your courts with thanksgiving. For you, O oh Lord, are good. Because of your unfailing love, we can enter into your house. Lord Jesus, you are our savior, our redeemer, and through you, we are justified. We worship you in the splendor of your holiness. And Holy Spirit, thank you for endowing us with the divine love and allowing us to be the body of believers through which you have blessed us here at St. Anna's and St. Stephen's. All around us is the evidence of your miraculous blessings. We thank you for the souls you've empowered to draw us into the kingdom by proclaiming the good news and sharing the love of Jesus. Father, we know that you've told us to bring our cares to you in prayer. We want to pray at this time for those with various illnesses at St. Anna's and St. Stephen's, Dwayne Turcott, Daryl Smith, Elaine Campbell, Rosalind Knight, Isabel Metcalf, Una Wood, and Janice Darlington. And we want to remember and pray our brothers and sisters who are in long-term care, Winnie Bradford, Joanne Graham, Helen Arnett, Anne and Alfred Cockle, Lauren Dennis, and Louise Renard. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and power infinite, have mercy upon Canada and inspire our leaders that they may seek you, seeking wisdom and willingly obey your commands. Uh, we think of all the conflicts in the world today. O oh God, the King of righteousness, lead us in the paths of justice and peace. Inspire us to help break down all the tyranny and oppression. Have compassion, O oh merciful Lord, on all who are lonely and desolate. Be their comforter and friend, give them solace, and bring them to the fuller knowledge of your love. Almighty God, Father of mercies and giver of all comfort, we pray for those who mourn, that they will cast every care at your feet, and may they know the comfort of your love. O oh, blessed Jesus, you accepted the pain and suffering of the cross. Grant us in the midst of all the persecutions we face, may we hold fast in faith, and that we can and will endure. May our perseverance honor your name. O oh, powerful Father, Help us not to bring sorrow to you by the way we live, but teach us how to revere and treasure you and your covenant with us. Help us to remember that our bodies are your temple and we do not belong to ourselves. Remind us to be more grateful and to for never to forget the good things you have done. You forgive our sins, redeeming us from death and crowning us with love and tender mercies. Holy Spirit, Keep us mindful of your presence in our daily lives and help us to be quick to respond when you move us to action. 
Please touch the hearts of those who do not adore and accept you as their Lord. Help them to love Jesus with all their hearts, soul, and strength. Patient Father, help us not to yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let us never grow so comfortable and complacent that we fail to notice the beauty of Jesus' love, the faithfulness of his mercies, and the sweetness of his magnificent grace. Help us to lift our voices in thankful praise to him and bow before him in adoration. Holy Spirit, remind us of all those we need to forgive and help us to be quick to forgive. Bless us, so in turn we will be a blessing. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Eileen, would you come and read scripture for us? Two other quick things. One is, it's la next Sunday is the last Sunday of the month. So always on this Sunday, I always I'm supposed to remind you to bring your cookies because uh, Eileen's going to be gathering up cookies to take them down to Lighthouse Harbor Ministries. So make sure you bring some cookies in and put them on a table in the hall. And I should have said, because I do want to say, uh, Aaron, myself, and Shannon are going to be rushing out after church this morning because Aaron's got a field hockey game. So apologies. Um, but we're going to be... Phew, out the side door uh, so I don't get told off about getting her there too late. But she will be late because it's a long sermon. <laughs> <laughs> the scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than in over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So why embark on this series um, during this fall season? Why should we endeavor to become contagious Christians? Well, as, I was, as I've been mulling over this series for a few months, I've come to two different but complementary answers about why we should become more contagious. Two sides of the same coin, you might say. The first side is basically what I spoke about last Sunday. When I was looking at who we are, what it means to be a church, when I was looking at our vision and our mission. In many ways, last sermon, last week's sermon was the first half of the introduction to this entire series. Because I think it painted a very clear picture of what Jesus wants us to do. We looked at the stories in John chapter 20 and John chapter 21. After the resurrection of Jesus on that first Easter night, the disciples, John tells us, are in the upper room with the doors locked. There are perhaps many reasons for those doors to be locked, but I think we get the sense that the disciples are huddled together in that room and they give us a picture of what the church 
in general has become. The church is huddled. They're disoriented by events outside of their control. So the disciples that night don't know what to do. Their master was crucified on Friday. When they went to the tomb that morning, the stone was rolled away and his body was gone. They're trying to work out what it means for them. What should they do now? Where should they go? So the disciples that night are a bit lost. Their world has been turned upside down. And so they go to the place that they've shared a meal with Jesus on that Thursday night. Because it is there that they find some comfort, some blessing, something to cling to. In a real sense, that room becomes their church building. Jesus shows up, and as we saw last week, he breathes on them. Peace be with you. Peace, shalom, life. Jesus comes and gives them life, his life. He breathes his spirit over them, into them. Remember what Jesus had told them way back in John chapter 10? He said, I have come that they, my sheep, may have life and have it to the full. So having received the spirit of Jesus, the disciples at that point are full, overflowing in the abundance of Jesus. And so it is then that Jesus reminds them why he called them, why they are his disciples, why he died and rose again, why he has breathed his spirit onto them, why they are full. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I am sending you out, out beyond these walls, outside of this room, beyond a church building. John switches gear, or scene, and the very next thing he tells us is that the disciples have decided to go fishing, which for the most part is something they are experts at doing. They've been fishing their entire lives, and so they go and they do something they know they can do. But, John says, they catch nothing. After a long night, nothing. Well, guess what? Early in the morning, Jesus appears and stands at the shoreline. The disciples at this point don't realize that it is Jesus. He calls out to them and says, Children, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. So Jesus immediately speaks again and says, Throw your net onto the right side of the boat and you will find. There are a ton of good, sensible reasons why casting their nets on the other side of the boat makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But the story is being told to us by John so that we get the point. Jesus tells them to do it. They do it. And having done it, they catch an enormous catch of fish. Jesus had told him in the upper room, as the Father sent me, I am sending you, sending you, sending us, where? Outside of these walls. What are we supposed to do? Why would Jesus be sending us outside of the comfort of a church building and church meetings and gatherings? Cast your net on the other side of the boat. Follow my word. Put your trust in me. Obey in what I obey, what I've told you about me. Catching fish is what Jesus has commissioned the church to do. The funny thing is, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. You've gone to church long enough, you hopefully have heard a sermon or two on the fact that the gospel is not something to be kept in a box inside a church building. The gospel, the love of Jesus is something to spread to the four corners of the globe. And Jesus wants his church to do the spreading. Go and share this love. Jesus wants us, the church, to catch fish. 
fact, I would go a little further than that. I love how Christopher Wright in his book, The Mission of God's People, says it like this, quote, it is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, so that, or as that, God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission. God's mission. I love that. It's because you see, it's not that Jesus shows up at the side of the shoreline that day and he's seeing a bunch of disciples with nothing to do. So he thinks, well, I need to get them to do something, so I'll give them a mission to occupy their time. Cast your net on the other side. That's not what's happening. Jesus' plan for the entire world is about catching fish, redeeming everyone and this place, this planet we live on. And in order to achieve that goal, Jesus has formed a church. And into that church, his followers then get blessed and commissioned. Through you, Jesus is saying, you will achieve my vision. Will, not hopefully. Jesus is not creating this thing in a pipe dream. You will cast your net on the other side. You will. Therefore, as Anderson St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church, our mission statement is encouraging. And I ended up with that last week, inviting all of us, let's recommit to present Jesus' good news to the world. Let's aspire to follow Christ's teaching. What was that teaching? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And let's seek by serving our community to share God's love with our neighbors. We are sent to share Jesus. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission. God's mission. But I want to switch gears. I want to flip the coin and look at the second part of why I think the church should become as contagious as we possibly can be. And again, I don't think any of this is a surprise. A lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And their grumbling triggered Jesus to teach three stories in Luke chapter 15. I love how Luke introduces these wonderful stories in Luke chapter 15. He opens up the chapter, and you know what Jesus is doing? Catching fish. People who are in desperate need of being saved, the down and outs in his words, they are being drawn to Jesus because they're being drawn to Jesus' character, his grace, his love, his mannerisms, what he's teaching, what he's sharing. So there he is, Jesus, beginning of the chapter, catching fish. And those that represent the established church, they're also there. But they're grumbling. He shouldn't be doing that. He shouldn't be catching fish. He shouldn't be welcoming those good-for-nothings, those worthless beings. Why? Because he's already got us. He's caught us. We're the good guys. In our opinion, Jesus should just show up every week in the upper room where the church gathers, and he should do what he should do. Bless. Bless those that have come. Breathe on them. Give them life. Not worry about those who are outside the walls. 
They're grumbling. Jesus knows they're grumbling. And so he teaches three stories. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Well, I grew up in Northern Ireland. I saw sheep, cows all the time, but I have absolutely no idea how to shepherd any of them. But I can't imagine a scenario where in a large area, like down in round County Down, up and around the Mourne Mountains, where you would lose a sheep or two. One would just wander off, get lost. One would find, fall down into a ravine or a crevasse. Or, you know, one would become lunch for the local wildlife, right? Okay, Jesus, this sounds, I can kind of understand where you're going with this story. Keep going. Okay, so you've lost one of a of hundred sheep. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you find it? Now, Jesus, again, I'm not overly experienced in shepherding, but I think the scenario that you're placing here sounds nuts, if I'm honest. I don't actually think I would leave 99 that I currently have in the open country and go off looking for one. Go off in search of one little lost sheep. That doesn't sound sensible. Jesus asked at the beginning of the story, which one of you can imagine doing this? The answer, Jesus, to your question is no one. No one sitting around is going to do what you're suggesting. So Jesus, where are you going with this story? What's your point? Well, when found, you can be sure that you would put it across your shoulders, rejoicing, and when you get home, you will call in your friends and your neighbors saying, let's have a party. Celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. Okay, Jesus, this story has completely gone off the rails. No one is going to spend a ton of money, more than what the sheep is worth, to celebrate that you found it. Unless we're missing something, your story makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, try this one. Imagine a woman who has 10 coins, loses one. Oh, Lord, we are all with you on this one. Perhaps not with coins, but we know you're getting at. Something small, right? Like rings, earrings, keys. We've all lost something around the house, right? Keep going. Preach it, Jesus. This sounds promising. Well, won't you light a lamp and scour the entire house, every bookshelf, every cupboard, every box, under every single nook and cranny, until you find it. Well, well maybe. I, I might do that if it's really valuable. But just like your previous story about the sheep, we still have nine, nine of ten, ninety percent. That's that's pretty good. Like we've only lost one. I'm not so sure. Not so sure we're going to make the effort that you're talking about to find the one. But I am a little bit happier with this story more than the previous one. I've got to be honest. But still, don't understand your point. Well, when she finds the lost coin, you can be sure. She'll call her friends and neighbors. Come, let's have a party. Celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Uh, no, Jesus. No, that's not going to happen. Just like the first story, you've gone too far. Jesus, you need some basic economics classes, right? She's lost a coin that's worth X. She finds the coin that's worth X. And you're suggesting she's going to spend 10x to actually have a party to celebrate that she's found 1x. It doesn't compute. It doesn't add up. 
Something's not making sense with these two stories. Are we missing something? Can you imagine sitting that day? You know, we've all heard these stories read so many times in church. But you actually put yourself in the crowd. Be, be part of the crowd in the middle, listening to Jesus tell these stories. I, I'm a bit of a people watcher. The, the girls are not happy with it. They think I stare. Uh, maybe, right? I just, I'm just, I just, I'm drawn to people and watching them walk from the right to the left. I think that's a bit freaky. I should try and get over that, I think. But I am a people watcher, so I can imagine scanning the crowd and reading their faces, seeing their body language as they're listening to Jesus tell these stories. And I can imagine seeing two distinct things that day. First, the religious folk, the church folk, they're baffled, totally confused, and actually they're fidgeting because they're uneasy. They, uh, there's something about what Jesus said they don't quite like. The implication that the lost sheep and the lost coin are of almost an incredible value. So much so that when they're found, there would be this party to celebrate them. Bongers. We like our budgets. We wouldn't do this. But as they keep scanning the crowd, there's another group of people that appear to be responding to Jesus quite differently. The ones who were introduced at the beginning of the story as being worthless, the down and outs, the lost, if I can say it like that, they don't look uneasy. In fact, their eyes are kind of bulging. There's almost little smiles appearing on their faces. And actually, their body language is telling me they are leaning in, leaning forward to Jesus. They are intently listening to him. And they're almost anticipating that something is going to be told to them that will blow their minds. Why? Because oh, I think they're hearing something <clears throat> that is giving them value. That they're not worthless, but are more than they can even imagine that they are. There's hope expressed in these two stories thus far that Jesus has told. That perhaps someone might care enough for them to move heaven and earth find them. Is there a chance that someone might care for them enough to move heaven and earth to find them? Is that what Jesus is getting at in these stories? Jesus can see the response of both groups. And so he continues. There was a man who had two sons. Now, Jesus tells the story that has become known to us as the parable of the prodigal son. What a misleading title that is, given the fact that the father has two sons in the story. If you've never read the story, I'm inviting you, go home and read it. In fact, I'm encouraging you. In fact, I'm really saying, go home and read it over and over and over again. Read this story in Luke 15 at least once every day for the next week. Every day during this next week, read the story of the prodigal son and ask yourself one question, why should I become a contagious Christian? Why should any of us seek to become contagious Christians? Because every single prodigal, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter how worthless they might see themselves or how worthless we might see them to be, once they are found, the Father is going to host the biggest party we can imagine to celebrate that the one who was lost is now found. I told you this should not come as a surprise. This story explains why Jesus came in the first place. 
In his eyes, the world was full of prodigals. Every single person, all of us are the prodigals. Every single one of us have strayed away from what God created this to be. We are living our lives in accordance to our own wills and desires. No matter what we might think, no matter how well we are doing in our lives, those lives will eventually lead to the same destination for each and every person. A place of hopelessness, lifelessness, despair, and ultimately death. Humanity are just a bunch of prodigals. It really is a sad, sad story that humanity has created for itself. It is. But as the story of the prodigal is told to the crowd that day, the people around Jesus who have already felt and been told that they are worthless, they're leaning in. They're anticipating something. They're not full of sadness. They're not grieving. They're not shamed. Hope is starting to emerge in the depth of their beings. Why? Because Jesus tells them when the prodigal decides to head back home and grovel at the feet of his father, that prodigal expects the father to respond to him the way the world should respond to him. Judge him, punish him, rightly discipline him. But in the story, the father embraces him. We're going to have a party now. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast, people. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son, my daughter is here, given up for dead. But now, alive, given up for lost, but now found. Oh, can you imagine how the non church people might respond to this story that day? How they responded as they're sitting listening to Jesus tell this story. Do I think every single one of them at this point are weeping? Weeping. Not out of sadness. They're weeping tears of joy, tears of hope, tears full of life. They've been told for so long that they're worthless. And in one story, three stories, Jesus has raised them up to be priceless. A sheep was lost. A coin was nowhere to be found. And yet every one of them worth making incredible effort to find it. And when it is found, celebrate big time. Truly remarkable. Why would we think we should become contagious Christians? I think Sandy nailed it in her story. She didn't call herself a lost sheep or a lost coin. But I think her story tells us that's exactly what was going on. Because there's millions of Sandys out there. Millions lost sheep and coins, lost sons and daughters. In the eyes of Jesus, they are priceless. In the eyes of Jesus, every single one of them is worth giving his life for. He came from heaven and gave everything to save all prodigals. What's preventing the church from being more contagious? Well, the religious folks are gathered around Jesus and they've been listening to these stories. By the time Jesus gets to the end of the story of the prodigal son, it's pretty clear they've now been been depicted as the second son in the story. The one who doesn't wander off. The one who has stayed and has been working hard for his father the one who's been fishing, 
for years. The funny thing is, he too gets an invite to the party to come in and to rejoice that his brother, his sister, has been found. Another one that was lost has now been found. But they're grumbling. They're the ones that have been listening to Jesus and they're folding their arms across their chest and they're kind of a bit unhappy because it seems to me that as Jesus tells these stories, they are beginning to hear Jesus speak directly into each and, one of, each and every one of them. I think they're beginning to realize something when you put the three stories together. You've been working for me for all these years. But your primary purpose was to seek out that that was lost. The older son in the story makes absolutely no effort to find the younger brother. In fact, when the younger brother comes back, he's angry. The older sister in the story makes no effort to go after her younger sister. So what, what now for all these people listening to Jesus? Does Jesus turn his back on them? Does he wave his finger at the church people and say, you people have got it wrong? No. In the story, he invites them into the party for them to grab hold of what this is all about. He invites them into the joy of the Lord to become the shepherd, to become the woman, and realize the importance for seeking out the one that is lost. The church folks get invited to come in and grab hold of what they've been called to be and to do. Cast your net on the other side. When you do that, you will. When the lost are found, you'll join in in the best party you can imagine. Because you see, finding the lost is going to fill you. We all know that when we go to a party. We all fill, are filled with life. And we're invited to a party that is beyond our imaginings. Why become contagious Christians? It's who we were created to be. And because the world is full of prodigals, priceless prodigals. And heaven wants to have a party. I think the question for us today is are we ready to party or not? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, gathered at your feet, listening to these well-known stories, we've heard them so many times read, we've heard them so many times taught. We pray today that these stories will not just remain stories, but these stories will becoming a live, become a living, breathing reality in our lives, in the life and ministry of this church family. And we would just grab even just an ounce of how precious in your sight are the lost. Because we too were lost. And you find us. You find us through the help of others. We think of Patty and Sandy's story. And others. And if we all think back to our stories, there's always been someone helping to find the lost. Lord Jesus, send us. To 
find those that are lost. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Meeting Jesus always causes a change. Let's stand and sing together, I will never be the same again. same because we've been met by you blessed by you saved by you so may we never go back into the room and lock the door may we be your people sent by you blessed by you filled by you to be salt and light for your glory's sake lord give us eyes to see Give us hearts that are open enough to see the lost. Not merely to see them, but to seek them. And somehow be involved in their lives, just like Patty. Because just like Sandy, when one is found, a party begins. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the presence and blessing and power of the Holy Spirit fill us, flow through us today and always. And all of God's people said, Amen.